It's a privilege to be here with you guys today. So good afternoon to those here in Charlotte. Um, good morning and good evening to those around the world that are joining us remotely. Um, I, I have a distinct privilege today of, of introducing our, our guest speaker who happens to be a um, not just a local rock star, but also a, a good friend of mine. Um, in the, the seven weeks, Brad mentioned I'm new here heading up the, the healthcare practice for Method on a, at a global level. It's been a, a pleasant surprise. Those of you that may have already listened to my my podcast, Josh did a, a similar type of message here. Uh, a pleasant surprise to see the amount of work in healthcare that Method has already done. Uh, there's a number of different verticals that we've worked in, a number of success stories, and, and has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, above and beyond that, it's also been, uh, a, a, I'll be honest, a little bit shocking to me how many of the Method staff actually have experience in healthcare prior to their lives at Method. Um, and so we've actually have a very deep bench in the, in the healthcare vertical. And, and my responsibility here is to, to help make sure the rest of the world knows that Method is in fact a healthcare company and we have great potential to solve a lot of the, the problems that, that plague our healthcare system. The way that I kind of look at some of those problems is we're at the beginning of a renaissance in, of consumerism in, in healthcare. And I think the consumers are gaining more and more power, more and more authority in this healthcare space. And that's a lot about what Blair is going to share with us today. Looking at that, the, the shift from, from volume-based healthcare to value that is a very, it's a very payer-centric construct, but it really doesn't mean much to us as in, from a consumer perspective. Um, so as I introduce Blair under that premise, I was thinking back at the opportunities I've had to introduce other people I would consider rock stars in my life. And a few years ago, I had the chance to introduce Scott Hamilton. If you're familiar with Scott Hamilton, show of hands here in the Charlotte office. Uh, so we, we have a handful of figure skater fans. So Scott Hamilton is Olympic gold medalist from 1984. He also happens to be a, a fellow Ohioan, uh, native Ohioan. And I had the chance to, to introduce Scott Hamilton. I was in, a, in, the, in the green room with him beforehand and his publicist, I would give me this long list, basically like a paragraph or a page worth of stuff that she wanted me to say as I was introducing Scott Hamilton. And I said, "We, you only have like 30 minutes on the stage. Like I'm going to take up 15 of it reading all this stuff. And so I showed him the list back in the green room and he goes, ah, just introduced me as a short, bald guy. And I was like, are you serious? He goes, serious, just introduced me as a short, bald guy. So here's a guy who's, you know, Olympic gold medalist, uh, we were paying him tens of thousands of dollars to be our speaker for that day. And just the the humble nature of him just to kind of consolidate it down and actually make a joke. Well, similarly, we have a, a local rock star here in Charlotte who has uh, done more for philanthropy than I will ever do in my entire lifespan. Um, he is on more executive boards. If anybody here in Charlotte is familiar with the brand of Ortho Carolina, it is solely Blair Premise's responsibility for having delivered that. So he is now uh, heading up the marketing operations, uh, creativity and at SCA Health that many of you I'm sure are familiar with is a subsidiary of Optum, uh, part of United, and they run more than 300 ambulatory surgery centers around the United States. Blair's gonna talk about that shift from volume to value and how that's really relevant in this consumerism space. So please help me in welcoming Blair Primus to the stage. I just asked him where my ten thousand uh, dollar check checks in the mail. Uh, thanks uh, everybody for being here today. I am um, looking forward to uh, sharing some thoughts. Uh, it is undoubtedly going to be a conversation, so don't hesitate to um, ask questions. Uh, give me some suggestions on thoughts. Ask for clarification. Uh, really, what I want to discuss um, in 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 the next you know few minutes or so is some of the challenges related to marketing the volume to value shift. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar in the healthcare space of what that is. I have a few slides that will kind of describe the environment. Um, but by all means, I, I do want to think through like how how we will have to move to marketing this communication to consumers, marketing this change to consumers. Um, anybody in healthcare in here today? Anybody like in the healthcare space? Yeah? Awesome. Uh, anybody want to be in the healthcare space? 
Okay. <laughs> Usually those questions have different sets of hands that, that get piled up there. Um, so it's uh, uh, safe to say that um, uh, this is an opinion of one, but I think many of you might, might agree. Um, I can't think of an industry that is maybe a bigger failure in the history of the world than the United States healthcare system. Right, four point five trillion, four four point five trillion dollars in this country, almost twenty percent of GDP spent on healthcare. Just healthcare is bigger than the entire GDP of Germany, and just behind Japan. But our outcomes are below the fiftieth most developed nations in the world. So, in any business model, if you're going to invest money in something and spend a whole bunch to generate results. You would not use U.S. healthcare as the case study for that work. So, some of what I'm going to chat about today is a spinoff, is an innovation, and is an evolution into that problem. Now, I am hopeful that we will make changes in people's lives in my lifetime. However, uh, I'm not naive to think that we will solve it all <laughs> in my lifetime. Uh, either because the mechanism of healthcare is incredibly complex and takes a lot to a lot to move through. So I'm just going to jump in. Let me see if I can get this going here. So telling the volume to value story. So real quick, um, Scott mentioned it, but I lead the marketing communications and events team at a company called SCA Health. Uh, we are one of the leading uh, management operator organizations for ambulatory surgery centers in the United States. Uh, we have 320. Uh, for 325, depending on the day, uh, we are a wholly owned by Optum Health. For any of you familiar with Optum, uh, they are uh, a $255 billion healthcare company. And that company is owned by United Health Group, who also owns United Healthcare. And they are a $550 billion company, I think the third or fourth largest revenue company in. The United States, maybe even in the world. 317,000 employees. Optum has about 150,000. We are 11,300 teammates of that big engine. What's different about our business, and the reason why we're not branded as Optum, is Optum spends 95% of their time in the primary care space. We spend 95% of our time in the specialty care space. Hence the management and operations of outpatient surgery centers, which are most often utilized by specialty care providers. And when I say specialty care, I mean anything but primary care docs, right? Orthopedics, cardiovascular, GI, ENT, urology, women's health, et cetera. So this is us. We have uh, about almost 9,500 physician partners. Uh, we've got a little bit over 1.4 million uh, cases done in our facilities uh, annually. Uh, we are, uh, let me see here, coming up on 20 some odd years old. We rebranded re our company last year to SCA Health. I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, and I am one of the 11,300 teammates as a part of that. I made a little reference here just in case you're curious. We actually acquired a company last year that is specifically dedicated to, gen to GI. And that's why you see some of the uh, orange dots on the screen. It dramatically increased our footprint by almost a quarter of the size of our company. Okay. So everybody familiar with McKinsey? Everybody heard of them before, right? Okay, so they do a really great job every year deep diving into healthcare. It's one of the sort of the Bibles of uh, healthcare analysis and marketing. And amongst the hundreds of pages of details, a little bit like Scott Hamilton's uh, you know, CV, um, what you'll find is this, uh, this little section. The results show that the future of healthcare delivery is fundamentally evolving to become patient-centric, virtual, ambulatory, in the home, value-based, risk-bearing, driven by data and analytics, enabled by new technology, and funded by private investors. So on the surface, I'm like, wow, cool summary, perhaps. But here's what's really interesting about it. Our business, SCA Health, and I'm wandering into the darkness, SCA, I'm, a, I'm from Jersey. So let me say a couple of things, first of all. I'm originally from New Jersey. So the fact that I'm standing in one spot, challenging. Secondly, I have items in both hands, also very challenging. So you're going to probably see some swaying because it's the only other thing I can really do to accommodate the lack of mobility and hand gestures at the same time. Okay. All right. So 
ambulatory, we're, we're a uh, manager and operator of 320 ambulatory surgery centers. I'm going to talk about value-based and risk-based care, but data and analytics, right? Certainly in the sweet spot of all of you associated in here and certainly one of the sweet spots, right, of, of method. And so these are, these are key data points because any future change that's really going to occur in this $4.5 billion industry is going to have to lean into specifically some of these key initiatives. Okay. So here's a very quick primer on what the difference between the two are, right? Volume-based care is what most of us experience today otherwise known as fee for service. And it simply is every single time you go to the doctor and have something done and that episode is completed, if anything goes wrong, if you need to be readmitted, if you have to have something else checked up, the healthcare process charges you again. How many of you go and get your car serviced and when you leave the dealer, it doesn't work. You willingly repay them again to fix a problem they should have fixed the first time. I mean, we all do that, right? Name an industry, for real, that charges you a second time, a third time, a fourth time. And in our complex environment, specifically in U.S. healthcare, you're going to get about 50 different bills. I'm not joking. 50 different bills. The word, like the letters EOB sometimes like are like sh shiver in people's minds, right? An explanation of benefits. It's not even a bill. It's the pre-bill to tell you what your bill is going to be. I mean, like that in and of itself is like just insane, like nonsense. Let me send you a letter telling you what the letter you're going to get is going to say. And by the way, I dare anybody to actually explain what's in an EOB because none of the language that's in there, anybody who's not a doctor can understand. Okay. I, I will also try my best not to be ranty today, but I can't promise. I can't promise. I will do my best. I will do my best. Okay. So um, it is essentially a, a fee for based, a fee, a fee for service based universe that we live in. You have a medical necessity. You see medical professional in any sort of industrial complex, whether it's a hospital system, a private practice, regardless of what it is. If everything is great, clap your hands, things are good, you go on about your life. If they're not, and you need to see be seen again, you will get charged again. Okay. In a value-based model, you change the incentives of the providers to actually give them a reason to never see you again. So the oddity of healthcare is that every medical professional takes an oath to do no harm until they're put into the industrial complex of U.S. healthcare. No physician, for the most part, I know we read terror horror stories on the internet about docs that do crazy stuff, but the vast, 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 vast majority of physicians are doing their best to make you healthy, to heal you, to get you better. It's the rest of the system that causes the complexities and that causes the inefficiencies that drive to volume being the determining factor of success. There are many hospital systems in this country. We have a couple here in Charlotte that are nonprofits. That's an interesting mechanism to generate health from. I'm not criticizing hospital systems whatsoever. It's just interesting to be a nonprofit, right? That has to clean out sort of the bank account by the end of the year in an effort to maintain that status. They are required to do social good in the community. They have to meet a minimum standard of care in the community to be holding on to that status. And sometimes those designations are in direct contradiction to what physicians take an oath to do, which is to cause no harm. So what if we realigned incentives to make physicians think about providing quality care the first time? And if they did that, you know what would happen? We'll pay you more. A hip replacement might be roughly for the average healthy patient, same anesthesiologist, same surgeon, same setup, somewhere between fifteen to eighteen to twenty thousand dollars more between the different physical environments, just the facility that it's done it. So imagine if you could actually move them, and this is where my speech gets a little selfish because I work for an ambulatory surgery center company. However, imagine if you can move them to a lower cost environment and align the incentives to minimize 
damage to the patient. And then because you did that, if you saved $15,000 on the care, guess what? You could actually give the provider and the facility more money to have the care there and the insurance company still pays out less. So think about this very simply as fee for service versus aligned incentives to drive the cost of care out. And there's a lot of things in here and I put a lot of terms on. Some people call it sick care. They're a little more in the zealot universe where they call it sick care, but otherwise other folks call it proactive health care. There's common sharing knowledge. You share data. You manage the cases globally. You talk to other physicians and ask them, is this implant better than that implant? And if the data doesn't prove it, let's get rid of the other one and just use a single one, which means we can drive down the cost for it. Now, $4.5 billion, a trillion, trillion dollar industry. Clearly, Blair can stand up on this stage, not allowing him to move left or right and not use his hands when he speaks and be very preachy and righteous about how we can get there. Fact of the matter is we can move minuscule increments in this massive engine, but this is a very popular topic in the healthcare community tons of buzzwords around, are you moving from value to, from volume to value, value-based care? There's even more things like bundled payments, risk-based agreements, tons of language and jargon around it. But this is simply, as best I could do at least, be not being a healthcare provider, a definition of the two environments. Our company is actively involved in managing through value-based care. So I'm going to go on a te teeny bit off my slides here, uh, but um, there's something called the quadruple aim, another jargony thing. And essentially what it says is that you want to find an or you want to find an environment where patients can have high quality care at lower cost, not saying cheaper, just saying lower cost with high patient satisfaction and high physician satisfaction. Quadruple aim. If you can accomplish that, you can actually start to move the needle in terms of providing quality care at a lower cost that satisfies both the provider and the patient. And almost 40 some odd percent, 41 or 42% of our 320 surgery centers have at least one value-based contract through providers at our centers. Actually, I said that wrong. 60% have one, 41% have one or more. Some of them have two and or have three. And the way we do that is we partner with specialty doctors to say to them, either through a financial relationship, meaning they could be a co-owner of our outpatient facility. I swear I'm going to get to the marketing slides in a minute, but this is fun. Okay. The, the reality is they can get to, uh, through a financial relationship, they can be co-owner of the outpatient center, right? Right. Meaning that the distributions that get paid out from a, the profit of the center, they now own part of it. And so they have equity in the facility that they're doing the surgery in, which means they have a vested interest in it being safe having the latest technology, right? The last thing we all want to do is own a house and not take care of it, right? You're going to invest in it because you own it, right? Same thing, same philosophy here with the centers, with, with outpatient centers. The second thing is, is that we can actually show data, data and analytics, going back to McKinsey, that says if you have care in many cases in an outpatient setting, not only is it more convenient and easier to navigate and simpler for the patient, patient satisfaction, but the environment and the operating room for the physician is also increased provider satisfaction, quality in many cases, tough thing to measure, tough thing to measure because quality is an interesting thing to measure is 10 days after your surgery walking quality or is a hundred days after quality, right? There, so there's some standard measures that physicians and organizations put in place to measure quality. So quality typically is better. And in my previous example, cost is oftentimes 40 to 50% less. There are some cases where even in the United States, we're actively involved in and delivering quality care through a value-based setting. It is by far though, the minority of care that's done in the United States. There are some high adoption industries or services, I'll call it service lines, orthopedics, GI, things that have some routine nature to them are typically good good in this environment. You know, everyone who's 45, anyone who's 45, probably should have had your colonoscopy by now. Those are routine types of things. Gynecological work, routine. Sometimes urology work, routine. And a lot of that you can actually manage very well because it's a set set of no knowns. Acute orthopedic care, 
if I blow it off this stage, I didn't know I was going to blow my knee out off this stage. I couldn't account for it. So you have to navigate some of those challenges. Behavioral health, low adoption in value-based care. And given what we've just gone through with COVID and what we're learning about through a, through a, through a marriage, I have five children and I can see all how they all were impacted um, through COVID uh, behavior health wise. So it's a huge issue that really should be remedied on the value-based side as well. Okay. All right. So what I'm actually here to do, I, I, by the way, everything I just said, actually, I just like learned from being in healthcare. I don't actually do any of that. I do the marketing of it all. So I, I, uh, I play a value-based care person on TV, which is what that, which is what that was. Okay. So, um, the challenge is precisely what I actually just described to you. The conversation we just had, imagine trying to market that. How do you create a population who is more educated about their healthcare decisions? In that environment, step one through step nine has to happen for them to be able to activate on some of these. Unless you have a truly personal interest or you are radically altered by the care you are given, in many cases, you just move on to the next meeting on your calendar. And this is the challenge. Care in this country is driven by the physician, as it should be. As it should be. They're the subject matter expert on what's best for you. They should drive the care. The challenge is they're not incentivized to do it in a way that addresses value-based initiatives. Not their fault. They are not trained to do it, nor do they have an incentive to do so. If none of us are incentivized to do things, it's much harder for us to do it. So care absolutely should be driven by doctors. The problem is they're not educated enough to make the change. And for those that are educated and the consumers are educated, oftentimes they resist it. Why? Because their insurance company doesn't cover it. Or the hospital that is cheaper for them to have it done, it's 45 minutes away. There's one right here. Why don't I just go to this one? Well, this one is five times the cost. So there's resistance built into the system. So the marketer has to be savvy to communicate to the patient why they should care about these things. And then on the right side of the slide, you have to consistently educate and inform the audience of all of the changes and the nuances that occur on a day-to-day -day basis. It's trying to determine like what's inside of the Google black box. You would be marketing Google black box every single second, all the time. I was chatting with somebody earlier. I was given like a demo on like a healthcare AI tool. And I kind of was like half in fear, half in awe of like what it can actually do to determine care. I was like kind of freaking out a little bit. My hope was it was just somebody behind the screen typing it all in, but it wasn't. Okay. We need to build trust and you need to be a loyal provider of that content. So if you're going to get something from call it SCA health in a newsletter, why would you believe it? Why does it matter to you? You've got to build trust in that environment. So we have to partner with physicians to have them provide us the information required to communicate it in a way that is trustworthy and builds loyalty based on the decisions you hope they make at the bottom right of this slide would be to transform consumer behavior. You've got to think about a way to make us all care just a little bit more about our healthcare like we do our 5G connection. Or if I can get Wi-Fi somewhere or not. Or how I look in this North Face vest. I tried on a couple different vests before today. But I didn't really think about my healthcare much today. So this is important because the challenge we face as a marketing department, communications department, as we all face, my job is to talk to you about stuff, right? So 30,000 feet, a brand is only what you all believe it is. doesn't matter what I think it is. A brand is only what you think it is. Marketing is what you think yourself. So I've got to figure out a way to have my marketing message, me believing it's valuable and trustworthy, and then you believing that the brand you're taking in is that same thing. How do I get my brand to match my 
Did you see that move, by the way, with the microphone? I kept it right there. My brand to match the marketing message that's in there. That's the challenge that we face as marketers. Okay, any thoughts on that? Or questions? Yes. Is that Everfoot cares about healthcare so much, but it is just so complicated that it's just a point to did that. Was your last point? I'm sorry. Was that there's apathy? You said what was the word? It's like inaction. Inaction. Yeah, totally. Um, it's like uh, it's like online betting. Not that I do not online betting. There's so much data on what kind of bets you could make. You're like paralyzed by what I'm like. I just hope the team in blue wins. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The challenge then is to really fine tune this and actually get really low funnel audiences, right? So somebody that's about to have a surgical procedure in my universe, this is just specific to me, somebody who's very close to looking for care, you've got to really make sure you build a relationship with them. So at the point they know they need it, they don't have to navigate the other nonsense. They've had their second opinion. Well, I don't mean nonsense. It's all very important. The other things that are out in the world. They don't have to navigate second opinions. They've already done that. They don't need a confirmation of their diagnosis. They don't need to understand the nuances of their healthcare insurance company. They they know it's right down the street. Once they've got through some of that, which sometimes is difficult for us to do, we can then hone in on the bottom part of that, which is to say, now that you know you have rotator cuff tear, here's the decision you should be empowered to make with your provider in the room. Where am I going to have this done? What are you doing to help drive down the cost of care? Are there patient satisfaction measures that I can look at? And there are. Are there provider satisfaction measures I could look at? Look at and there are. Awesome. Now, what are the other things, real quick, one of the, I'm just gonna top in on that. One of the other things we face as marketers, which is challenging, is, um, and maybe it's done deliberately, but I didn't, you didn't hear me say that out loud. Um, behind the nuclear industry in this country, Healthcare is the second most regulated in the United States, more so than financial services, even after uh, 2008 and 2009. So we have to navigate so many restrictive covenants, anti-kickback, Stark Law, HIPAA, privacy, protected health information, all critically important, but not aligned, not aligned for simplified communication and providing clear education on care and options. It's difficult, difficult, difficult to manage. It's almost as if like you just can't seem to get through the muck, right? The harder you try, the, the, the or maybe what is it, muck or quicksand, some analogy there, it's in there somewhere, but you continue to sink the harder you try to get out. Go ahead. Right, so this is probably just my, the, that I'm at thousand feet. Yeah, yeah. But the message of, of uh, better quality outcomes, cheaper, everybody makes more money, should be appealing to insurers, doctors, facilities, and patients, right? So clearly I'm missing something here. Yeah. It's not where people are going. Yeah, yeah, great point. So um, there are some other big players in in healthcare that are not aligned with those four um, components. And some of them are systematized care, big giant systems. Others are insurance companies. And in many cases, it sometimes is actually the government regulation or the state regulation that gets in the way of a lot of this. There are things called certificate of need states, for example, and a certificate of need state would mean that you need permission to build an operating room for just to simplify it. You need permission from the state to build an operating room based on the demonstration of the need that that population would benefit from having it. Well, if my operating room competes with somebody else's operating room, that company has every intention of blocking my application for a certificate of need. And so there are forces at play that create this unaligned incentive to get there. And so I'm with you and my team, we spend a lot of time talking about, again, selfishly in my world, why ASCs are a great choice for patients, why ASCs are a great choice for doctors. And in some cases, I know I told you we barely talk about um, uh, primary care in my world, we have just started to communicate with primary care groups to say, are you sending your patients to a value-based aligned specialty doctor who down the road, if the patient needs surgery, will have chosen a facility and met that quadruple aim? So there is some work being done, again, 
for, I mean, like, makes me feel like, why do I go to work every day? But like fractions of dollars compared to this giant thing that we have to manage through. But it does get us closer. So great question. I very much love your perspective. Like, what am I missing here? And what, what is at play are just these unaligned entities based on the current model. And there isn't enough innovation around the risk of the risk. Like, let's put enough at risk here to see if we can actually make change and do it in a way that is safe. I'm, and what I mean by safe, I don't mean safe like harm of patient. I mean safe like financially safe, right? I mean, lest we all forget, the number one goal of any business is to stay in business. Yep, go ahead. Hang on to his point. Look at the entire value chain of healthcare. Who cares enough to start to drive those? Who's going to be the driver, the one that creates it? The patient. You got to be the consumer. I think, you know, consumer pushback through the history of our country and really through the history of the world, right? I mean, when enough people get motivated to fight something and make a difference, it typically works. A few random dictatorships in the history of our, of the world maybe would say otherwise, but for the most part, enough of a movement will cause change. They'll deselect insurance companies that don't align with their incentives. They won't choose providers that don't go to a lower cost facility. They, they, we've just got to empower them. And so the challenge we see it as the marketing communications effort sits in the center of some of this. How do we have more talks like this? How does a non-healthcare provider have a healthcare talk where I'm very minimally discussing the marketing? I'm not even showing a piece of content or video here. And I think I actually have one more slide. <laughs> right? And the fact of the matter is, this is what we've got to try to try to get to. I think, I think it's empowering the consumer to take more accountability for their care. We just got to do it like on the biggest level ever in the history of anything. The takeaway really, I hope, I hope for you guys, the takeaway today would be these three things is that could, you know, you have to convince consumers that they actually do have a choice and where they get their care done. Heavy lift, heavy lift. As we've talked about, I call it like grudge purchases. Like healthcare is a grudge purchase. Nobody is like, I really want to call a plumber. If anyone's a plumber, awesome. But nobody really wants to call one. You kind of have to call one. I would say the same thing for healthcare. Now, wellness, going to the gym, very different. And guess what they don't have? Insurance. They take credit card. But you got to get through the drudge of it. And we got to convince people that it's not drudgy. It's actually, it's actually cool. I shouldn't laugh because it's my job, but it's, it's cool. And you should be educated and informed on the decisions you're making. And then the last thing is we have to consistently be in touch with consumers as to why the first two things are important. It is an investment-based model. Marketing is an investment and not an expense when it comes to this solution. It's got to be an investment. You've got to convince organizations they've got to consistently communicate the benefits of value-based care for the purposes of the quadruple aim. And if you do it and you find an organization that believes in it and has enough budget to make it possible, you should be able to communicate um, as effectively and as consistently as you need to to make this shift.